How can we know whom to trust as a source for climate science? Skeptical of everything. Help. Love you both. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as you should be. Skeptical of everything. And how can we know whom to trust as a source for climate science? Um, this is a tough question. And um, I don't know if you have any names. I don't actually have any names that I trust. I, I just know that um, there are there are honorable and dishonorable climate scientists out there as there are honorable and dishonorable everythings out mm -hmm. there. And um, because there is a conclusion that is now the, the thing that is accepted, it's harder to uh, publish evidence that countervails uh, the conclusion. That said, the conclusion has so much support, the broad conclusion that anthropogenic climate change is happening um, from so many different kinds of evidence across so many different kinds of both empirical and modeling evidence um, that broadly speaking, um, my, my doubt of that conclusion is near zero. Um, but any individual um, result, I am highly skeptical, even more so than of any other scientific result um, because it's become so politicized. And I'll just tell, I'll tell an anecdote an actual story here. Um, back when we were professors at Evergreen, I was on a hiring committee to hire um, a, a climate scientist. And one of our finalists, so academic job hires, you do, um, you, you pull three people um, to the short list and you do, you know, a couple day um, interviews on campus with them. And because it was climate science, we dragged these people out into the woods and walked around the forest with them and talked with them one on one. And, um, I was asking one of their candidates one-on-one um, -on -one, uh, about a paper that he had published and asked him why in the methods he had talked about having used five models, and it was, you know, like all these papers that had like 20 authors on it or something, um, why there had been five models that were discussed in the methods, but only one of them reported in the results. And he laughed as if I was joking. And I pursued it. And then he said, well, I, I don't, I don't know. That's, you know, that's not my, that's, that's not what I do. And I thought, okay, you know, your, your name's on this paper. You're trying to get a job, um, doing exactly this work. And you have no idea what justification there is for having said that you had put your data through five models, but only reported on one. That sounds like a replication crisis waiting to happen. And no, the guy did not get the job. Um, but I, I worry that that happens too much um, with the giant caveat, like I started with, uh, that um, throughout, since before this was politicized and um, across all sorts of domains of types of data, including places uh, where the scientists aren't calling themselves climate scientists, um, the, uh, the conclusions overwhelmingly lead uh, to the, the, res the data overwhelmingly suggest the conclusion that we are... Um, plummeting towards anthropogenic climate change that may at some point become irreversible. Um, I would say James Hansen, I find him trustworthy as a human being. I would say I don't trust the models. It's too easy to lie with models. If you put enough factors in them, you can make them mirror uh, any behavior without doing so because they actually match the uh, the causal element. However, it's easy to be a verificationist with models. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, models um, can be used to predict things that you might go check empirically, but they can't be used as an empirical check. Mm. Yep. Um, but what I would say is the that which we know for sure is already enough to worry um, a great deal. Um, CO2 and methane trap heat from the sun. We've known this for more than 100 years. The fact that both of those uh, molecules are rising in their density in the atmosphere, also known to be true. That that will have some effect is certain. How much the effect, we can disagree because it's in a complex system. However, the important thing to track is that the um, the danger that one hits a threshold point at which, for example, the release of frozen methane clathrates from the Arctic kicks us into a phase in which we no longer have any control over temperature because you get a positive feedback where um, the temperature goes up that uh, unfreezes these um, frozen methane molecules. They are quickly released. That raises the temperature further, which unfreezes more, and you get a positive feedback. Mm -hmm. That thing 
is not something you need to detect from here. In fact, you won't detect it until it's too late, right? You can detect that there are these bursts of methane in the Arctic, which we've now seen. What we don't have is really good baseline data on whether that's happening all the time. But there is reason the Yamal craters, which I pointed to, in uh, Siberia tell us that there are new geological processes going on that appear to be the result of sudden releases of methane. So what we know is there's a whole hell of a lot of methane up there that could come flooding out all of a sudden and could take this question entirely out of human control, right? We don't know where that threshold is. It could could happen this evening. Okay? Well, the, the, the fires could be the thing that do it, right? The release of carbon from these fires is we extraordinary. We have no idea where we are relative to that threshold. Right. We know that it's out there. And, um, you know, the day that it happens, it's not going to make the news. Nobody's going to know that it happened. But there's a day at which this no longer is under human control. So the point okay. is, given what we can say for sure, the rational course is to say we are playing with something very dangerous. The downstream consequences are potentially absolutely catastrophic for humanity. The solutions to these things are likely to be highly generative. Now, here's the hitch. If we were to solve these problems... It would threaten the business models of many established businesses. That's why we don't do it. It's not that it would make life horrible for us to solve these things. In fact, speak my a little bit more. So, I mean, you, you hid, you you buried the little of it. You said, um, you know, solving these problems could itself the solutions could be generative. Yeah, like the solutions could actually be good for individual humans and the economy. What it won't be good for is the established. Uh, organizations that have already made a business in the old economy. Right. And in fact, you can see this by projecting backwards. Um, we've been talking about, um, you know, carbon tax forever, mm -hmm. right? A substantial carbon tax. Now, a carbon tax has a cost, an economic cost that's substantial. But if 25 years ago or 30 years ago we had seen this coming and we had instituted a moderate tax then, mm -hmm. which had driven the innovations in battery technology that we have seen, right? All sorts of things that we all regard as awesome about the modern world would have happened earlier. Yeah, what this happened, is what regulation is supposed to do. Right. Incentivize you to limit the next the negative externalities that you impose on the world. Right. Now, the key thing would have been, and frankly, we were the country that dragged our heels, but the mm -hmm. key thing to do would have been to partner with other nations so that we would not have been at disadvantage for instituting that carbon tax. We could have had that the cost... Um, distributed in a fair way. So that the point is innovation of a kind that's great, right? You don't want to breathe exhaust, right? right. Frankly, um, I was using an electric chainsaw just early this week. Electric chainsaw, it's pretty darn good, right? It's not loud. It doesn't put out exhaust. There are all sorts of advantages. And the point is it hasn't been plausible until recently because the battery technology has been lagging. So um, if you can solve the economic competition problem, and you can get everybody to share their bit of the burden, and you are not um, constrained to protecting currently successful businesses, you can do great things. And so were we to address climate change, it's getting late, but were we to address it, we would be living in a time when there was plenty to do for innovators because we would have to figure out how to do lots of things that we already do in some new and better way. And so the point is that's a lot of good jobs.